it is it is live now. We're live on YouTube. So anybody that joins us, then great. Uh, otherwise, let's get let's get it going. So, Richard, thanks for thanks for being with us today, friends of God. Thanks uh, for having me. Yeah, friends of God is is glad to have you back. You're definitely um, somebody we enjoy to have in our wheelhouse. We we'll get our cronies to keep bringing you back. Um, so today or tonight, uh, we're going to be discussing some things that are going on in the church, specifically re regarding Vatican II. Um, before we get into that and before we discuss the, the main topic, I just wanted to introduce yeah. you. So everybody at the Friends of God um, may, have, may, may know you a bit, but uh, um, if you don't know Richard DeClue, he is, um, I guess, would you title yourself a theologian? Would you say, would you give yourself that yeah. moniker? Yeah, he's a theologian. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm with the STL, I'm qualified to teach master's level theologians. So. Yeah, he's cr you're credentialed, bingo. Yeah, so he is a theologian and he's getting his doc, he's finishing his doctoral at um, the Catholic University of America there in, in DC. Uh, he lives on the East Coast with his his family, his wife, and three three little ones. And uh, I asked I asked Richard if he could give me something that could like humanize him, that could bring him down from this ivory tower of brilliance to like something my level. And he actually he digs soccer. And I know a bunch of my buddies would give me give me heck for liking soccer, but I I, I dig it. I dig it. He's a he's a Liverpool fan. Yeah. Uh, I'm an I'm American soccer guy, I like the Portland Timbers. Sorry, but uh, yes, yeah, so Richard Richards into soccer. Um, so Richard, let's let's get right into. It. Let's just dive right in. We're here tonight to talk about um, Vatican II. Now, to kind of preface the the topic, I, I, anybody that's kind of dipped their foot into Catholic blogosphere or media or Twitter or whatever in the past six months to you know a month you'll find that there's a lot of people debating and discussing Vatican II. And you, you've already done a few videos uh, with Chris Plants, with Tim Gordon. Um, and so we thought we'd bring you on tonight to discuss, uh, in part, one of the major documents, uh, Lumen Gentium. Um, and before we get into it, everybody should know that we're not gonna dive at deep. We're gonna, we have about an hour here. Um, and if you'd like to go deeper, Richard and Chris Plants will be uh, running a, a deep dive into many of the Vatican II documents over on Richard's YouTube page, uh, to Clues Views, right? Is that correct? Right. To, yes. To, to Clues Views. And uh, that'll be up coming soon. So be on the lookout for that. And to maybe to wet your whistle, we'll get into it tonight. So Richard, we're going to go into Lumen Gentium, the light of Christ, right? The, the Christ is the light, light to the nations. nations. The light yeah. to the nations. Yeah. yeah. So light of the nations. <laughs> Why, why would you say that Lumen Gentium, would you, would you put Lumen Gentium like up in the uh, top three, top two most important documents of Vatican II? And if so, why top would you do that? Top two, yeah. Top two, okay. Definitely top two, yeah. Why, why would you um, do that? Well, one, because there's actually different levels of documents in the Second Vatican Council. And though there are two that are the highest level. So they're not all the same. Mm -hmm. um, so Dei Verbum, Mm -hmm. which is the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation. And then um, Lumen Gentium, which is the dogmatic constitution on the church. Right. Those are the only two dogmatic constitutions. Okay. Um, and then you have Sacrosanctum Concilium is a constitution. It's the, uh, um, and then there's a pastoral constitution and then there's some decrees and declarations. So they actually distinguish different kinds of, of documents and, the most weight are on the dogmatic constitutions. And I also think that those two mm -hmm. are really the core of one, the theology being presented throughout the rest of the documents. Um, so they're kind of the foundation mm -hmm. and sort of, they're the ones that the other documents kind of end up touching upon. Um, even though technically Dei Verbum was like, I think it might've been the last one to be promulgated. Um, well, they were, well, they were good. using it yeah. to help build the other ones, and then they yeah. had to publish it. Yeah, there. I think now, it was the last one. But mm -hmm. could, could you help me clarify something about dogmatic constitutions? I, so, what we're saying is, the church <laughs> has has taught things for two thousand years, nineteen hundred sixty-two yeah. years, or you know, give or take a few. And so, the dogmatic constitutions are pulling all of the pulling from many sources, or, or I guess time periods that the church has taught things, and kind of putting them into one statement is that what is that how we would understand it yeah it's i mean that's a good way of of understanding it um because like the decrees and declarations are often 
giving directives for things to happen. Whereas the dogmatic constitutions are actually presenting sort of a, um, a summary of certain of church doctrines. Okay. So it's, yeah, they're trying to sort of present in a positive manner um, and specifically in language more akin to today's use. Okay. Um, that was the part of the idea was um, to try to present it in a way that, that was more in line with contemporary people's language, the way that they might speak, um, and to present those truths sort of in, in a positive fa fashion. So instead of just saying, okay, this, unlike, you know, condemnations of different heresies and things, it wasn't you know, heretic A says this, let him be anathema, where it's sort of like in the negative, yeah. like here, here's what you can't believe, and there, ergo, this is what you must believe. It was more of just, a, okay, let's summarize and present the church's understanding of these important topics. Yeah, um, so, if you're, so if you're looking yeah. for a list of things to stay away from, if you're looking of like documents that provide us, uh, I guess, uh, boundaries to say, please don't go outside this realm. This is not the, what the church believes. You'd go to most of the old older councils where they give anathemas, right? Like, like Trent, mm -hmm. they give anathemas on many things. Whereas what we're reading in the dogmatic constitutions like Lumen Gentium is a, instead of a contrapositive, you give a positive statement of this is what the church is. So the, the right. like I was reading through it today, the, the beginning is, is quite beautiful because it does give a lot of the analogies you see in the old New Testament about what the church mm -hmm. of, of Christ is. And I, I think that's helpful for somebody who's maybe not, maybe doesn't understand the historical perspective of, oh, what, what heretic is the church responding to here? You know, what heresy? Right. And it, it's confusing sometimes in the, in the um, documents from hundreds of years ago. And so I think that that does help. Good. Mm -hmm. So what, what would you say in regards to how the church so in Lumen Gentium, it, it focuses on the church, right? Yeah. I, I, I've had a difficulty in my own understanding of the church because there are so many ways to speak. There's this word church, and it kind of can become almost too vague. How does Lumen Gentium clear it up when we talk about church per se? Right. Well, first of all, I think I'd like to give, if you don't mind, to give some historical background to this. Sure. Yeah, it, do that. It's kind of important. Um you know, Vatican I, um, which happened between uh, 1869 and 1870, um, was cut short. It, it, had, it was supposed to do a bunch of documents, but the Franco-Prussian War in 1870 meant that it had to stop. Mm -hmm. So it never finished. Well, they had what, what, basically they went on recess, and then during that recess, meaning like there was a break before the next session, um, the Franco-Prussian War broke out and it never got regathered. And so the Pope ended up issuing a declaration that we're just suspending the rest, you know, and it, yeah. it never got picked back up. Well, they were supposed to, they planned on issuing a full document, a, a, a dogmatic constitution on the church. Um, but they actually only ended up doing the Pastor Eternus, which was on primacy and, and papal infallibility which is what that council is most well known for. Yeah, that's what I know it for. The dogmatic yeah. definition of papal infallibility. Well, mm -hmm. it never got to complete the work, the full work on the church. So when Vatican II was called, it was sort of presumed that, okay, well, this council will pick up where Vatican I left off. And it does do that. And we're not really talking about that part of the constitution today, but it does. It ends up um, reiterating Vatican I's um, teaching on papal infallibility yeah. and it talks about other ways that the church teaches infallibly as well um, as well as other levels of assent and levels of magisterial teaching mm -hmm. so and how the how they are enacted um, but yeah lumen gentium it's the word ecclesia for because ecclesiology is actually sort of my main area of, of interest in, in study but ecclesia really means assembly. Mm -hmm. That's what the word church. It's a gathering and assembly. And it, it has references back to the Old Testament, um, kahal from the Hebrew, 
um, and it's the gathering of God's people. Um, now, the let me do it this way. So the, the document itself, when, when you're talking about ecclesiology, so the study of the church, you're looking at the origins of the church, you're looking at the nature of the church, mm -hmm. its essence, right. what makes the church the church, um, the structure of the church, and the mission of the church, right? And so the document's going to talk about all those different aspects of the church. Like, where does the church come from? Mm -hmm. What is her nature or essence? How can we understand her? And it gives different analogies right. um, for understanding the church. And then it's going to talk about the hierarchical structure of the church. Right. So how the church is constituted with, you know, a hierarchy of authority. And then it's going to talk about the lady. It's going to talk about the religious life, mm -hmm. universal call to holiness. Um, the church is a pilgrim mm -hmm. because it kind of understands itself as a church, as, a, as in exile, in much the same way that yeah. the, the Hebrew people were in exile multiple times in history. It's, it's scriptural. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's the study of ecclesiology, study of the church is clearly bound up in um the narrative of salvation history that we you know if you might want to if you want to put it in this language adam and eve were the church they were the people of god prior to the fall after the fall they're you know they're still bound up as the sons and daughters of of, of god but christ god has to have this plan to bring his people back into his his family into eden right into into the new eden into right. uh his his abode his bosom um yeah that's interesting it is I, and it, it the document i think does a good job of explaining the importance of the church in salvation because i think you know you've probably heard this many times people say well i'm spiritual not religious yeah or i'm christian but i really just pray by myself i don't really like organized religion mm -hmm. they much prefer disorganized religion apparently um but <laughs> At home, at home with, with yeah. yeah, or it's just me and Jesus, right? Like yeah. all you got to do is accept him as your personal Lord and Savior, and then you don't really need to worry about anyone else, right? Well, that's yep. one, it's unbiblical. Yeah. Um, but two, it's actually missing the broader picture of salvation history. And now, now what's interesting about not just this document, but the ecclesiology as a subset of dogmatic theology or of systematic theology, depending on what terms you want to use, is that like in the Middle Ages, for instance, in the scholastic period, it really wasn't a separate topic. There wasn't really theology of church per se. Now, there, there, were, there were just individual comments that relate to what we would call ecclesiology, but it wasn't a subject to be studied, right? It was just sort of the church was the milieu within which you did theology. Yeah, you studied, you studied God, you studied Christ, it, you studied the Son, right. you studied grace. But then when it came to the church, it wasn't... It like, was, it, yeah. 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 It wasn't really the object of study. It was just sort of the milieu within which you did theology because, well, partly because if you think about it, the, the great schism was fairly new in the middle ages. I mean, you know, the, yeah. at least the, the made the great one, the big one. Um, and then the Protestant Reformation didn't happen until the 16th century. Yeah. So there wasn't a whole lot of need per se to, to, to do a right. Because those yeah. are somewhat, questions that are kind of arise out of a new situation Novelty. for now you've got believers who aren't members of the church. Yeah. This is something I bring up with my students as I teach high school to I teach theology. And I will tell the, the kids that if you look at the, the creed, uh, you get through the, the first two thirds, you're like, Oh, this all makes sense. I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, I believe, you know, all these things. And then when you get to the end, I believe in the church, which is very right. profound. Um, and, it, and it's been that, you know, we've always said that it hasn't been like something they tacked on in the 16th century because of Protestantism. Mm -hmm. We've always believed that. But I think what's different, like you're, you're making a good point that there is this historical need in the past 500 years to discuss what do we do? What do we do about the fact that there are people outside of the physical bonds of Rome, you know, per se, Rome as the church that are Christian because they're baptized fully with the proper norms that they have, they've even received the sacraments because we have the Orthodox, right? And we have our, we have our Eastern churches, but Eastern churches being in union, but still the point being that they're not in the sense, the Latin church, they're not in the sense, the Roman church, right. um, mm -hmm. which 
complicates the matter. I'm not even bringing up Protestantism because that's a whole another mess that I think, I think Lumen Gentium does a pretty good job of like getting up to the line of saying, we, we don't want to, to um, scare off our Protestant brothers and sisters with language that is com- that, that uh, completely alienates them. I think that there's some great apologetics apologists out there who say the, the right thing. And I believe this, that there are many Protestant brothers and sisters I have who are far, far more devoted to the word of God, far more devoted to our, lo- our Lord, spend more time in prayer than I do. Um, and yet, how do we deal with that when, you know, they're not receiving the sacraments. They're not sanctifying right. the way that the, the church has, that Christ has ordained. Yeah. Right. So. No, absolutely. Sorry. sorry if that went off a tangent. No, it's fine. It's important. And it's an important historical aspect too. And I think that actually leads to a, a good intro to the topic because the very beginning of the document associates, when it starts talking about the church, the, the first chapter is called the church or the mystery of the church. Mm-hmm. So it's actually understanding the church as a mystery. So, um, and, it, and it uses that language, I think, to, to show that it's actually, like you were saying about the creed, it's an uh, aspect of what has been revealed. It's not some ancillary thing. Yeah, it's part of the it's sacramentum. It's a mystery of faith. It it's is. Part of, yes, that's this, uh, yeah, yeah, it's part of the sacramentum, which means in Latin, right. the bond, right? This bond between us and Christ, being, being the mystical body of Christ. Right. But specifically, we're... Yeah, the church as a sacrament is mm-hmm. actually in the very first numbers. You know how the, the church documents are numbered. Yep. Um, we call them paragraphs sometimes, but sometimes the number might have more than one paragraph. But <laughs> in any event, the very first thing it talks about is Christ is the light of the nations. Um, and it basically then says that the, the goal of the church is to bring this light of Christ to all people. So it's already talking about the origin of the church is Christ. And the church is sent forth to bring others to Christ, to spread the light of Christ. So the church, by her very nature, is, is missionary. So the mission and the essence of the church are linked, just the way that in Aristotelian metaphysics, the telos of something is part of its essence. They're related. And, and the air- purpose or the end of something right. is related to what it is. And, and the ergon, right? The functionality, right? So this means that the hierarchy, the, the structure, the function of the church needs to be towards mm-hmm. this goal, right? This is why I've like, I've had a difficulty with um, some of the language in the, uh, uh, you know, I don't I want to say the modern church, but in the church that I've grown up in, because in many ways, I feel like I've been told that, that the hierarchy of the church, the structure of the church is kind of like fluid like like it's it's just this cloud of 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 believers i've I've even heard this you know in my own catechesis and i and i think that that doesn't it doesn't help because that sort of gets away from the function because what because when you think of a cloud right when you think of sort of just a milieu we're like well what's the function whereas you look at something like this that has a clear structure it's got a handle it's you know it's got Mm -hmm. pines with aquinas on it Sorry, right. plug another show, but That's you know. Fine. It, hey, um, my, <laughs> people probably didn't notice this, but in my one of my videos, I think the one with Tim Gordon, yeah. when he interviewed me and Chris, I actually had my um, introverted but willing to discuss Thomistic metaphysics. That's that was right. the mug I was drinking out of. So it's another Matt Frad mug. So, I'm, so Sorry, Frad, if we plug your name. But yeah, <laughs> there's got to be a function. There's got to be a function of the church so that it reaches its tail, so that it actually is aligned. And this is a, so the Aristotelian right. language can be complicated, but, you know, the, the, the puzzle piece fits the puzzle, right? This is the goal right. of the church, which is Christ sanctifying the world, bringing him, right. bringing him into his, his uh, family. Right. Yeah. And I do think so the, the church, I mean, the, the second chapter is the, is the people of God. Mm-hmm. And I think in, since Vatican II, a lot of the liberals have played up that term a little bit. Um, now, it's a fully traditional mm-hmm. term. I mean, St. Augustine talks about the people of God. That was one of his major doctrines on the church, which, of course, Ratzinger slash Pope Benedict did his original doctoral dissertation was on the house and people of God in St. Augustine's doctrine of the church. That was his original dissertation. Um, But for me, at least, I think Lumen Gentium, the notion of the church as sacrament is actually the most important one. Mm -hmm. And because it does, it says, since the church in Christ is a sacrament, 
that is, you know, assign an instrument that is of communion with God and of the unity of the entire human race. Okay, so it, it defines the church from the very beginning in number one as a sacrament of salvation and unity of all mankind. So it's a sacrament, so it's a sign and instrument, meaning just like the other sacraments, right? It's a sacrament um, that affects what it signifies. Yes. So the church affects the unity of God and man, which right. is the primary one. So it's the vertical relation is the, is the foundation. Yeah. But from that also comes a horizontal relation amongst humankind. Yeah. From amongst men. Mm -hmm. So it's the sacrament of salvation and unity for the whole world. Mm -hmm. And so it's, that's its main function in the world is as yeah. a sign and instrument of salvation. I like that idea that, that it, it signifies. I know that this is how we define sacraments, that it, sign, it affects what it signifies. But if you think about it, that, that idea that God is a Trinity, that God is a community, oh. communion of persons, right? That, that, that the whole point being that God is interacting with us, right? This idea of a line that God, there's this clear connection between us and him. There's a difference. And then there must be a connection. But then that connection then leads to what you said, which is what I think has been sort of, like you said, emphasized a bit by the liberals, this horizontal nature of the church. The church is about right. the people of God. And I think that what I really want to get back to, and I, and I, I think that uh, a lot of people like you and, and Tim and Chris Plants and, and others, you know, great apologists, are trying to help us keep, the, I, don't, I don't like the word balance too much because it sounds kind of Eastern, but to keep that in check, to say, no, 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 we're not just the horizontal because that right. we need to have this clear connection with our Lord. And it can't just be me or you with God. If it's you with God and then it's me with God separately, then there's this whole disconnect. There's nothing down, there's nothing going on horizontally. Yeah, I like that. Right. Yeah, because I mean, because Catholic, the word Catholic doesn't mean just universal. It means whole, integral, complete, full. Yeah. Um, Balance is actually sort of an important aspect of Catholic teaching because typically um, one, one popular understanding of a heresy is that it's the emphasis of a church or of a truth at the expense of others. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, the church is a communion of people. Okay, but rooted in communion with God. Yeah. So there can be the tendency towards, you know, well, really what we're all about is our communion or fellowship. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, no. Um, then you can also go the other extreme, which is not, no, it's just about me and Jesus. Right. It's not about the fellowship assigned by the community. It's about me and Jesus. It's just personal salvation, mm -hmm. nothing communal. Well, mm -hmm. no, that's not right either. You know, I, I actually had someone I knew once try to tell me that in heaven, we're all just going to be focused like laser beams on, on God. And that's it. No. I was like, ah, we believe in the communion, communion of saints. Right. Um, but I was, it's pretty interesting what you just said, because you said, oh, well, yeah, it makes sense because of the Trinity, mm -hmm. right? When you said that, I was like, I literally was about to pull out this quote from Ratzinger about it's like, that. It's like we're part of the same church yeah. or something. <laughs> we talked about this beforehand, so I was kind of impressed. Yeah. But no, he says, I mean, in his, this is from Principles of Catholic Theology, Building Stones for a Fundamental Theology. Mm -hmm. um, he talks about how the revelation of God as a Trinity kind of completely, it, it helped correct what was, or fill in what was lacking in the ancient philosophers like Aristotle and Plato and Socrates, um, because they could only think of God from natural reason as good as they did it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but they could only come to understand God as one and as the, and therefore for them, individuation was actually a lack of perfection. Hmm. So having a multiplicity is somewhat a lack of perfection. And the, uh, the, the, one of the lowest parts of the, of the um, Aristotelian metaphysical structure is relation, huh. right? It's one of the weakest or least fundamental parts of metaphysics in his thought, right? Uh -huh. Well, the revelation of God as a Trinity kind of turns that up side down on its head yeah because now the i'm just going to read this quote really quickly from um i might read a couple quotes from ratzinger's book sure but he says um 
This means that the, the mystery of the Trinity has opened up to us a totally new perspective. The ground of being is commun communio. Mm. So if God is the foundation of all that exists, which was true in, you know, even in Platonic and in Versatilian um, philosophy, but knowing that God is a Trinity means that God is the foundation of all existence. We know God is a communion of three persons. It's a triunity of Trinity. Mm -hmm. That's the basis of all existence. So now relation is actually a divine mode of being. Mm -hmm. the, the, the persons of the Trinity in Thomistic terms are, um, the persons are defined as subsistent relations. Yeah. You know, they're perfectly, and it's a mystery, but it's this ultimate unity in distinction. You know, one and three, three and one, you know, mm -hmm. there's, and it, to such a perfect degree, we literally can't understand it. It's beyond it. It's like trying to teach calculus to a squirrel. You know, you just, at some point, it's just beyond what our little minds can comprehend. Right. But it's a fundamental aspect of, of the, tr the ground of all being, which means that really sanctify, I usually do this in my intro to theology class, um, but God then creates an order to communicate himself to creation. And, and this is bringing up the mystery, the, the Trinity again, sorry. No. Lumen Gentium, the first sections actually end up going through God, the father, God, the son, and God, the Holy spirit and how they relate to the church. So there's a Trinity from the very beginning of Lumen Gentium. There's a Trinitarian understanding of the church, mm -hmm. which is also something we share closely with our Orthodox brethren as well. And there's actually a brilliant document written by the international theological commission or um, Catholic Orthodox dialogue on that. Mm -hmm. um, but Ratzinger basically goes on. Oh, and by the way, that quote, he, ac he actually drew it from the Lubach, by the way. Um, mean, yeah. But um, he, he, Ratzinger goes on to say that basically this, there's a relationship between the object of our faith and the subject of faith. Now, what does that mean? The object of faith, meaning that which we believe in. Right. So the triune God primarily, right? Mm -hmm. The belief in the Trinity has to be reflected in the believing subject. Yeah, the, the person, the, the church. The believers, the believer, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a, a unity in distinction. We are members of one body, but in some sense, there's the ecclesial eye as well. The church is as the transtemporal believing subject throughout Tran all of time trans temporal so, believing subject. Yes. okay that's so he understands one. that the ch church is actually a person in some sense like it's a it's a it's a believing subject it's not mm -hmm. a person but it's a subject so it is the church is it, and it's linked to the idea of christ the head of the church who's his body so it's now, all tied in are we using analogous language or is this what is this i mean i guess the reason why i asked that is because I mean, I studied a little bit of Hindu theology and it sounds like, and maybe I'm misrepresenting this, but it sounds like somebody could take that and use that in language of like Atman, right? That, that everybody's all the same and we're all a part of this giant divine being. Is, is the church using analogous language when you say that transtemporal, sorry, I, that, that's a big, that's a word salad that I have never tasted before. So it's, I think it's, I'd, I'd say it's more of a, it's, you could say it's analogous. I, I think you could say it's also just a mystery. Okay. Because it's not, yeah, I mean, I think, I don't really get too much into Hinduism. I don't know much about it. But, but <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to throw it's that. It's obviously, curveball. no, it's just there's things I could say that I don't know I want to get into. Yeah. yeah. Um, sometimes they, you know, they, people can reflect truths imperfectly and bring it to erroneous conclusions as well. Mm hmm so there, there might be some vague reflection of truth that they're getting at with that, mm -hmm. but it's obviously not expressed without error. Maybe that's a good way of putting okay, it. Okay, yeah, and we can like kind of um, put that to rest because I don't, I don't yeah. know, I, I couldn't push back. Nor I mean, the, <laughs> no, I mean, the question, I mean, it's even been a philosophical question, right? The, the Plato struggled with this as well, the one in the many. Like, what do you do about that? You know, that's a very fundamental philosophical question. Mm -hmm. um, but no, so basically his, what Ratzinger ends up saying is that, um, uh, oh, where is it? Um, what well, you're looking for, I think it's, it's funny that we could say the word church, you know, and if I brought this up to like an eighth grade Catholic 
elementary school student, they'd be like, yeah, this is pretty simple. And I, and I probably would have thought that prior to like 30 minutes ago, but man, there's a lot, once you like, it's like Shrek, once you pull back the onion, right? Like there's so many layers to this that I, that I've never even dug into. And that's why I think doing this with you, like looking at Lumen Gentium or any of the documents really is helpful to me. And I appreciate anybody that's watching that, that hopefully you guys are getting something out of this that maybe you hadn't heard about the church before. So, yeah, sorry. For yeah, it's, it's really important. Anyway, he says that yeah. after he quotes De Lubach saying that, you know, the ground of being is communion because mm-hmm. the Trinity is the ground of being. Yeah. It says from this perspective, we can now understand how the unity of the object can include that of the subject. Belief in the Trinity is communion. To believe in the Trinity means to become communion. And so try to unpack this a little bit. We talk about salvation as a share in divine life, right? Yes. Well, divine life is com- utter, complete communion. Mm-hmm. That is divine life. Mm-hmm. So sanctity is bringing into unity. So from this perspective, to share in divine life means to be brought together in unity, both with God and through God with one another. So the church is not some separate, it's not even just a tool for salvation. It's actually a part of salvation. It's the beginnings of salvation. This is why, this is why some of the analogies for the church have been so helpful. Because whenever I go to Mass and we think of the Eucharist, right? right. I know I've, ever, I've had this, I've had this uh, pitfall where I go to Eucharist, and I go to receive, and I think it's about me and God. And I know that this is an error. Cause that's not what you, it's called communion also for a reason that we're, we're, commu- we're be, like you said, coming into touch with the yeah. triune God becoming part of communion. So then the analogy of, of communion helps me understand the church better too, because what, what is the, what is communion made out of many wheats of many pieces of grain mashed together, then baked. And then now it's a, it's something uniquely new, but it has come together for many things, just like the wine or many grapes that are crushed and then put together. And they're now they're um, almost irreplaceable. You can't ch- take a part out and say, no, 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 this is right. unique. Even though I think I'm in you know, communion with you, I'm actually only in communion with God. No, it's, it's all at once. And like you said, mysterious still, because each part, each, each individual, when we, were, when we, if God willing, we achieve salvation in heaven, yes, we will be completely adoring God, but that doesn't take away from we'll be together. We'll be with everybody. Like this is not something that we won't acknowledge that there are other souls in eternity with us. Right. Otherwise the new earth might be pointless. Um, yeah. Heaven is not just a platonic state of being disembodied. You know, it's Disney resurrection Disney. of the body. I mean, there's a reason for it, you know, Did, Disney world without anybody else. I'd be boring. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting that you bring up the Holy Communion thing because that's, again, providential here because that was actually my next quote I was going to bring from was actually, it's kind of the foundation of the Lubach as well as Ratzinger's ecclesiology, what, which called Eucharistic ecclesiology. Mm-hmm. Now, it's not just theirs. It's, it is traditional. It's in many ways, it's the patristic ecclesiology. Again, somewhat, you know, the Middle Ages really didn't focus on the church as an aspect of a subject of theological study per se. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously the sacraments, it talked about that, and of, which includes holy order. So there's already the hierarchy. So I'm not saying there's no elements of ecclesiology, but it wasn't a separate subject. Well, but even you still have elements of what are now we term ecclesiology in the patristic era, as well as in the medieval period. But the, the ecclesiology of the church fathers in many ways was Eucharistic. That was the understanding of the church, both the celebration of the Eucharist, because 70% of the time that the word ecclesia is used in the New Testament, it refers to the Eucharistic assembly. Mm. To say that ecclesia means assembly, 70% of the time it's talking about those gathered to celebrate the Eucharist. Mm. So that is the church is not just any assembly, Mm -hmm. but is the Eucharistic assembly. And this, this is St. Paul's theology. I think 1 Corinthians chapter 10, um, uh, starting in like the se- second part of verse 15, is real, or sorry, uh, 
verse 16. So 1 Corinthians 10, 16. Mm -hmm. I'm going to change one of the terms because it's often rendered participation, mm -hmm. which I don't mind because of its, it goes back to even Thomistic metaphysics. The idea of participation um, is actually not a bad, a bad word per se, but the word participation in English, it's actually in the original Greek, it, it could be, it's koinonia, mm -hmm. which is also properly translated it's this is not a stretch it properly can be translated communion that's which what it means so, which verse again sorry i have my I just sorry it's uh first corinthians chapter 10 10 verse 16 okay um very similar to what you were talking about with the reception of communion right this is saint paul the cup of blessing which we bless is it not a communion in the blood of christ the bread which we break is it not a communion in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Yeah. I mean, yeah my, His, my, mine has participation, and then it has translated below communion. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Think. And that's, that's what is some translated one loaf at the end there, too, but it means the same thing. So, Basically, we are one body because we all receive the one body. So this is sacramental realism that St. Paul's talking about. Like the, the, the way that De Lubac ends up talking about it is that the church makes the Eucharist, right? In the sense of the priests confect the Eucharist. Right. But in another real way, the Eucharist makes the church because it's through the reception of the Eucharist that we become members of the body of Christ, which is why the yeah. Eucharist is the highest sacrament of initiation. Yeah. You, you're fully initiated in the church primarily through the reception of, of Holy Communion. And it's, this is crazy. This is, this is, well, I don't know if it's crazy, but it's it blowing my mind a little bit because it is, it's like, think of it this way. Um, how many nations on, on the earth have lasted like, you know, they have like a divine, you know, or not a divine, uh, a, a legacy from king to king to yeah. king to king to king. And not many, you know, that we, we can, we can count so many. And even if you like, look at, you know, uh, a family line, you know, how many family lines have died off or whatever, or what, you know, we can say like how many lines have consisted. What's crazy about the church is that it needed to begin. It needed to begin and it needed to never end. Meaning like right. the bishop, and this is the promise of, of Christ that it won't. Right? right until the end of time that we will have this sacrament of the church continuously and it's passed down like you said through the eucharist this is the this is such an important sacrament and i mean i feel like we're talking about lumen gentium we're kind of getting into the eucharist a bit but it is so bound up in who we are as, as christians that we're continually participating in this the sacrifice of christ where the church is born uh, you know, the, the Catholic church specifically and in the, in the Lord's supper where we're brought together to be become a part of yeah, his mission. It's I'm, I'm like, I'm like reflecting on it and I'm like, ah, there's so much there. So I'll, I'll no, it is. It. It, and it's actually a perfect part of what, you know, the plan for this, this video is it's not just Lumen Gentium in general, but really focusing on. So the main subject that i was planning to talk about is the, the catholic church churches and ecclesial mm -hmm. communities because there's these different terms in the document mm -hmm. that sometimes people just kind of throw away it's like okay they're just synonyms yeah or they don't know what they mean mm -hmm. they just don't understand well why does it keep saying churches or ecclesial communities because you see that multiple times in the council documents yeah and it's actually tied to the eucharist um, so to kind of, I'm giving up my hand a little bit ahead of time here, but I think that's fine. In Lumen Gentium and other documents, the, the Catholic teaching makes distinctions. So, you know, there's the famous line in Lumen Gentium 8, which is the last number in chapter one of the church as mystery, where it says that the Catholic, um, this church subsists in the Catholic church. Right. That's the famous Some line. People yeah, right. About, yeah. And some, you know, and some people will make a big stink of it and say, well, okay, this is erroneous because it doesn't, it, do, it should just say the word is. Yeah. 
that's a misreading of it. I mean, it's actually, Ratzinger argues that it's actually stronger than just is. It's because it's actually has a deeper sense. Um, again, we're talking about how the Trinity is, the persons are defined as subsistent relations. Mm -hmm. So there's actually a sense of perduring here, which mm -hmm. goes along with this notion of transtemporal subject. It's the church continues to exist uninterrupted. It's not just a static, the church is, the church established by Christ is the Catholic church. When it says subsists, it means to continue to exist and perdure throughout the ages. Right. It's a gerund. So it's, a like that. Yeah, yeah. it's continuing to subsist. Yes. Or and exist. So it's yeah. It's like it's like saying Mary is uh, free from sin, but could right. she be free from sin at that just that point? No, no, no. She's free from sin, right? Beginning now and ever shall be. Right. That's that's the thing right. that we're trying to say here with subsist. It's not necessarily just one moment. Yeah. Like and the he, Catholic Church is the Church now, but right. it might be later and there might be somewhere else. And he he argues that it's also meant to reflect the fact that the it of in some sense, like we were talking about before, the, the personal character of the church, like the church as the believing subject, that it cannot ever lose. It's not just a collection of persons who happen to hold to these specific doctrines written on in these specific books. It is a real entity in some sense. It is a communion of persons, but insofar as it is the body of Christ and the fullness of the body of Christ, that it continues to exist as one subject throughout time. So that in other words, there's this notion of, I'm going to use some big terms and I'll explain them, I promise. There's not just synchronic unity, but also diachronic unity in the church. Yeah, and this yeah. is against those, who, whether traditionalist or liberal, mm -hmm. who say, oh, the church before or after Vatican II or whatever. Okay, because oh. there's not two churches, there's one church. Yeah. And so di synchronic unity means at the same time. Yeah, synchronous. So contemporaneous, you might say. Mm -hmm. The church of any given moment in history. Right. There's a unity around the world. Diachronic unity mean, means through time. Mm -hmm. So subsists in kind of is emphasizing that it's both really, but it's emphasizing that throughout time, the church is one mm -hmm. and continues to exist throughout yeah. the age. Yeah, it's and not that, just a static that the church is right now. Correct. It's the church continues to be the church established by Christ and perdures. Yeah, this this reminds me of of G.K. Chesterton's quote. I think it's about democracy, but it's I think I think that might be it. But it still sort of applies here that when we talk about tradition, it's giving a voice to the past that the, the, those who came before us are you know don't fall out of existence, that they are a part of who we are because we're, as, as we think of the church as a vine, right? That we're part of Christ's vine. Mm -hmm. we, still need the, we still need the things that came before us. Otherwise, right. if we just think of ourselves as this single moment of the church, we're kind of lopping off everything that came underneath that, that, that holds us up. Right. That, yeah. But, and this is why Lumen Gentium is so beautiful too, because it pulls, it pulls from everything the church has taught about the church in the past, but gives us this much more, I think, I think a very, very clear understanding of who we are. Um, and, and it's unique because when we think of a lot of corporate bodies today, um, even myself as a young person, I, I kind of thought of like, we're all brand new. Everything's every, we're living this 21st century. Everything's being, you know, <laughs> remade and we're all in, in doing new yeah. things. No, no, no. We're, we're a part of this world that, specifically Catholics, we're a part of this church that has built us up to who we are. I can't, I can't look at my faith and say, I'm, um, I'm Anthony Bedoy. I am by myself in my faith. No, everything that I have has been given to me. You know, I, my, my faith is from my father and his father and, and they are Catholics. Yeah. Yeah. And that's important. And especially for Christians. in Ratzinger's theology, but it's the idea of, um, uh, Starting to want to get into aspects of my STL thesis slash article in Nova Vetera, but I'm going to try to resist. Okay. Um, but no, the idea of receptivity, of reception, mm -hmm. that this is part of the, the, the nature of the sacraments too. You cannot give yourself the sacraments. Nope. You can't baptize yourself. 
only the priest can self communicate, you know, really, um, but he can't ordain himself. Nope. And not only that, neither can an individual bishop, which is actually one important aspect of Catholic Orthodox dialogue about the relative dependence of a local particular church on others. It cannot exist uh, in isolation. I see. Because a local church can't give itself its own bishop. It has <laughs> to receive from the fullness of the church as a whole. That's huge. Um, it, it's, it is huge. So the, um, this notion of receptivity is important because you can't just make church by just getting a group of people together. Like, mm -hmm. because the, the church has been established by Christ and it's handed on and its reality is made present in different times and places. But those people have to be brought into her and she has to establish herself in different locales. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's important. Now, here's where this distinction comes into place is that the, the document only refers to when it says that subsists in it only uses that to refer to the Catholic Church. It doesn't use that for any other Christian group. Mm -hmm. it, it's reserved for the Catholic Church alone. And, and um, the CDF actually explicitly states that. Mm -hmm. um, with the expression subsisted in, the Second, Vatic the Second Vatican Council sought to harmonize two doctrinal statements. And this is where this relates to the other aspects of our, our topic. So it wanted to harmonize two doctrinal statements. On the one hand, that the Church of Christ, despite the divisions which, which exist amongst Christians, continues to exist, continues to exist fully only in the Catholic Church. Yeah. And on the other hand, that outside of her structure, many elements can be found of sanctification and truth. That is, in those churches and ecclesial communities, which are not yet in full communion with the Catholic Church, but with respect to these, it needs to be stated that these elements, that is, yes. they, the elements, derive their efficacy from the very fullness of grace and truth entrusted to the Catholic Church. Yeah. Okay. So what's the deal with these terms? Um, by the way, it's very, the subsisted and it's very clear. It is the church established by Christ. It's yes. not... You know, that's we could go through that in more detail if you want, but it's no, no, it's this, is, this is this is this is clear to me. About. Yeah, this is clear yeah. to me. And it, it, I think hopefully it clears up for many people that what the church it, and I think that doc, that that line you just quoted is showing the intention of why the church used this language, because we do have to acknowledge we can't deny that there are elements of sanctification outside the physical bounds, what we would say, or the visible bounds of the Catholic Church. Right. There is baptism. This is not taking place in Roman Catholic churches, and some and these people are being baptized, and and yeah, and they're somehow are, grafted into the body of Christ. I mean, that's right. what baptism does. Bingo. So so, uh, yeah, I do I do appreciate that we're getting to this because I do know that it has caused uh, even people that I know, friends and family, uh, distress to think that like, oh, is the church changing its doctrine here? Or is it is it are we misunderstanding this? No, the church isn't doing that. We have to acknowledge the history of what's going on with Christianity. Um, yeah. yeah. And it's basically making three levels of distinctions. Mm -hmm. So um, this is all right now amongst within the Christians, right? So mm -hmm. you have the Catholic church in which the, the fullness of the, of, of the church ex exists. So it subsists in the Catholic church. The church established like Christ continues to exist fully in the Catholic church. Outside of her visible structure, there are elements. Okay, and then it uses the term churches or ecclesial communities. It's making a distinction between those two things. Why? Because of the Orthodox. Yeah. You might or the Oriental and the Eastern Orthodox. Mm -hmm. And why? It's all tied back to the Eucharistic ecclesiology we're talking about in the beginning. Yes. Because the, the Catholic Church teaches that the Orthodox have valid apostolic succession, yeah. which means they have valid, validly ordained bishops and validly ordained priests, and therefore valid celebration of the sacraments. Mm -hmm. Well, at least some sacraments. So it, the Eucharist. Specifically. So right. their divine liturgies, Jesus is really present, yep. and they really do receive him. Mm -hmm. Quick, quick question. 
Mm-hmm. Would that be considered licit because they because their bishop is allowing them to do it? I don't want to get into that. Okay, <laughs> I shouldn't have t- covered that rock. Okay, we'll put that yeah, back. no, I don't want to get into that. It, right, right, that's okay. opening a whole can of worms. Um, Sorry. Plus, it's also more of the realm of canon law, which isn't really my area. But By the way, what are you thinking? Sorry. Yeah, I need to. No, it's actually it. It's a very good question. I'm going to leave it at that. Okay. Um. <laughs> It's a very good question that I will not comment on. We only have like a few minutes left. So it's like, why don't I open the can of worms? I should have just. No, Um, but it is valid, right? And so they do have, because again, because the loaf of bread is one, we them in your one body. There's this notion, there's a sense in which, okay, the Orthodox have a lot of these elements. They're about Mm -hmm. as close to the fullness of the church as you can get without actually having it. Yeah. Um. So they, we do, in theological terms, refer to them as churches. Right. Okay, local churches, meaning mm-hmm. like the individual dioceses. Yes. Or, you know, church, like, okay, well, you've got the Russian Orthodox Church, the Greek Orthodox Church, and the Orthodox Church yes. in general. Um, they, they have that essence of church insofar as they have the Eucharist. Mm-hmm. But they're missing the fullness, and this is important, um, in the documents as well, but they're missing the universal communion under the headship of Peter, right, mm-hmm. of Rome. So they're still lacking something there. They don't have the Catholic unity, the universal unity. So that's something that's still missing. Um, but it's sort of a structural, something that's missing structurally. Yeah, because I mean, it's you, important. Because you were talking earlier at the beginning about the, the elements of the, what we can talk about the church. What is the church per se, essentially? What is the church uh, in its in its higher or structure? What is the church in its function, right. et cetera? And so it's it's like, what part would we say that the what, are they missing the structural component? Would you say? The, yeah, they're Mostly. missing the whole headship under the. They're missing the. I guess I should have brought this up more at the beginning, but the no, it's fine. the. The unity of the church is exists in many different forms. Unity of faith, unity of sacraments, and unity of hierarchical governance. Yes. They're missing hierarchical governance. Which is still important. We can't just like so, say yeah, that, there's, no, that's it is important. They're unified. So there's there's different aspects of the of the communion of the church, and they're missing the the hierarchical governance of the Bishop of Rome. Yeah. Which in their own theology they acknowledge. They just don't think we do it right, kind of thing. So okay. I don't want to get into the whole can of worms. I'm sure I'll no. get some hate mail about that. But <laughs> Catholic Orthodox dialogue is, in ecclesiology is, was my main area for my STL um, and my article in Novet Vetera. So mm-hmm. it's important to me. But Because we do share Eucharistic ecclesiology. That's one thing. My article is actually on Eucharistic ecclesiologies of locality and universality in mm-hmm. John Zizulis and Joseph Ratzinger. So comparing a Catholic and Orthodox theologian mm-hmm. on the question of um, the local universal church from a Eucharistic perspective as a means of tackling. So that which we hold in common the most mm-hmm. as the framework for tackling the thing that divides us the most, which is the papacy. Mm-hmm. So if you can, basically my STL thesis was on under, how do you understand the primacy of the Bishop of Rome within a Eucharistic understanding of the church? So what's the connection between the, the Eucharist and the Pope? Mm-hmm. And then I wrote another article I haven't had published yet, but it's on, on that same topic as well from another thinker but because if you can solve that if you can show where the pope fits into the eucharistic structure of the church yeah with ratzinger's argument that's a eucharistic office mm-hmm. um that's it makes more sense of the mystery and how they all relate together so it's not something extrinsic to the eucharistic understanding of the church it's actually an integral part of the eucharistic understanding of the church yeah I, I'm like trying to wrestle with that question because that's actually going to plague me. I think I don't, and I, I wish I could have more time to talk to you about this. It's going to plague me. How do you, to, like you said, that, well, that's the big question. How do you connect the papal office, the, you know, the entire being of the Pope with the Eucharistic communion that we have as Catholics, that that is what, as Christians, that's what binds us. Right. So, so uh, viscerally, right. Not just, I believe the same thing you do, but I, I'm a part of the body of Christ when I receive the body and you are too. And that means that I'm not, yeah, it's, 
it's going to plague me. I think I'm going to have to yeah, th think about that. There's a lot of details there. I'll give you the, the easy, uh, the uh, spoiler alert. Um, well, I mean, in some sense, he, it's because he helps make sure that because he's a reference point for communion, those okay. who are in communion with him mean that their individual celebrations of the Eucharist are the celebrations of the one church. Is this why, is this why we have the symbol of them taking the host and d dropping? Is that where that comes from? You're talking about in the, in the chalice? The, take a piece or, of the host and right? drop it in. Is that what that? That actually has more, typically more to do with the, um, the resurrection, I think, actually. And, but it's, there used to be the practice of, of the, the bishops. There would be some of the hosts consecrated at the bishop's mass would be sent out to the parishes yeah. in the early church. Yeah. yeah. To show the communion because, yeah. yeah. So, so he's the it's bishop basically the so that he helps to make sure he's the reference point for unity yeah. to show that the individual instances of the Eucharist being celebrated are all part of the one church's celebration of the Eucharist. And so it maintains the actual unity of the church as one, as she spread throughout the world mm -hmm. and throughout time. So that's a big part of it. Yeah. That that unity of the one church is an integral aspect of the individual celebration of it. Yeah. Because it can't be just a separate Eucharist. It has to be the Eucharist celebrating complete communion to be fully what it is. Mm -hmm. So the unity with the whole is an integral aspect of the meaning and effect of what of the individual celebration of the Eucharist. So it's the universal structure sort of yeah. thing, but it's still Eucharistic, even if he's not celebrating over like one mass that everyone's attending, there's mm -hmm. still a, a celebration, which is also why he's named in the anaphora, even in the, in the Eastern Catholic churches. Wow. And in the wow. Roman canon. Yeah. That's why we mention the, the Bishop and the Pope at every, in the, in the Eucharistic prayer. Right. So foundational, so foundational for, Mm -hmm. the church is is peter man and, and that and that whole, opens a whole nother can of worms which is why i think in my mind i probably should go and look at the documents of vatican one in relation to lumen gentium because i feel like now now getting to this end point I, I, we didn't bring the pope up for the first 45 minutes of this little little thing here and now we're bringing up the pope and it, it's so it seems so vital to this discussion he, he seems so vital to this discussion um, and we're, and we're getting close to the end and Rich, I don't want to, I don't know if I want to, I feel bad cutting you off or anything, but I know I, I want to respect your time and respect the time of our, of our viewers and all that. So I, um, I wanted to end with this idea of the light of Christ, if, if it's possible. Could we, could we can, end with, can we ahead. do that after I need, I need to finish. I, your, I, 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 yeah, I need to finish the thought because I mentioned the three. Yeah, do it. Catholic church, which is the one church of Christ is, is subsists in the Catholic church alone. Thank you. Bingo. Right. Churches. So those who are lacking Catholic unity, but still mm -hmm. have valid um, apostolic succession for valid Eucharist. And so right. theologically, we still call them church or churches. Right. But then you have ecclesial communities. So there's a reason. Lumen Gentium, when it says or ecclesial communities, it's because it can't call Protestants church. Because in yeah. Catholic theology, they are not church. Because they don't have... They don't have Episcopal. valid Eucharist because they don't have valid apostolic succession. No, they don't have Episcopate. So when it says it's actually using that term, now it's not spelling it out probably for maybe some you know, certain reasons, but that's why it's using ecclesial communities because it would be theologically erroneous to call them churches in the Catholic meaning of the term. Yeah. Now we might, in colloquial language, talk about the Lutheran church. Mm -hmm. or the Baptist church, right? or, oh, that church building. Mm -hmm. But from a Catholic theological terminal, terminological perspective, non-apostolic succession, non-valid Eucharistic ecclesial assemblies cannot be called church in a theological sense. I wanna, they are wanna... church-like communities, could but I, they are could, not church. Could I question something? Maybe they, you, you probably mm -hmm. know the language better. Um, and maybe this is too specific to ask you on the spot, but when it went in the Latin, because these were written, they were written in Latin, correct? Yes. Yeah. In the Latin, when it says church versus ecclesial community, what word is used separate? So ecclesial community, right? It comes from the Greek ecclesia. 
ecclesia. Right. Yeah. So then what word is used for church when it's specified, when it's different? So we say Greek, like you have the ecclesia Orthodox community. No, you have Orthodox community, you know, an Orthodox church, which we can still claim to be proper right. church. Still ecclesia. And then when it says ecclesial community, what I'm saying is like, I can yeah. see the difference, but like, but in the original language, mm -hmm. it seems like you wouldn't find a difference. Do you see what well, I mean? Well, it is because one's an adjective. Oh, one's I see. So we're, we're speaking of like Protestants in, in the sense of like an assembly of right. the people of God. That's not necessarily under a bishop. Right. They're not right. Yes. But they're not churches in the full sense. That's what, yes. Yeah. Actually, okay. it shouldn't be too hard to find the actual. I was pulling up uh, the Latin. Uh oh. Yeah. At the very end. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to do anyway. No, I. I it's, um, maybe too I specific a question, place. but you know. Yeah. No, but it, it is. It's an important, an important question. Um, but yeah, it's because it's ecclesial community. It's not. So the noun is community. Yeah. It's the not noun. church. So it's it's church like community. That that would be it. That sounds more like a proper way to understand it. It's church-like. It seems like it is church, but we can't right. call it proper noun church with an Episcopal and yeah, Episcopal order, and right. et cetera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Well, yeah, I, I appreciate you breaking that down for me because that does help me when understanding the, the how the church is speaking about our brothers and sisters in Christ. Because we can't I can't, we can't ignore that. I, I appreciate people who have pushed back on me for, for not being as charitable towards Protestants and, and, and Orthodox and whatnot, because they are still brothers and sisters in Christ. And we have to acknowledge that. Right. And so hope, hopefully, even if we made a faux pas earlier, go diving into some Orthodox stuff that we probably, I probably shouldn't be talking about. You, you may be more so. Hopefully they, this, we've been reverent enough, or I've been reverent enough that uh, um, we're speaking about our, our brothers and sisters in Christ with uh, respect and love. It's still quite important, even though, you know, there's difference. There's, there's, we have to be specific. Yeah. Yeah, there is. There's important differences. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I don't know if we can dive into the light of Christ because we, we are five minutes over and uh, we got places to go people to see. We, I know you're a busy dude. So um, if you, if possible, could we wrap up in prayer? We didn't begin. And I, that's my, that's my, my bad, my fault. Um, would you, would you mind leading us in some either, writ form prayer or sure. your own yeah yeah sure in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen. amen almighty god who art father son and holy spirit we humble ourselves before you and ask for your benediction to inflame our hearts and minds with a greater a greater knowledge and love of you and we ask that you pour forth your benediction upon the whole world to bring it into catholic unity in the church established by christ for the salvation of the world and may the light of christ shine to all the nations and may it enlighten our minds and inflame our hearts so that we can all be one with you forever in heaven. And together we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Of the, Father, the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Cool. Thanks, Richard. We really appreciate Welcome. you spending the time with us. Um, and everybody, thank it. you for, for joining us for the live stream. Um, yeah, please support Richard if you can. Go on over to, to, to Clues Views and uh, is it Sapientia Nulliformis? That's the blog. I think. Very good. Yes, yeah, Sapientia Nulliformis. Yeah. yeah. My, my language is great. On which site? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and anybody that's uh, watching, if, if you haven't supported Friends of God, we really, we were able to provide these things by your support. Uh, you know, give us a like, share this with with friends and family. If people are having problems with the faith, we're trying to do our best to, to offer something, some, some sort of substance to, in this time of crisis. So thank you all for joining us. And again, Richard, I appreciate it, man. You're welcome. Take care. Thanks for having yeah. me. Take care. Yeah.